And ta -da! <laughs> Sorry, we are back. Welcome back, guys. I am back. I hope you're back with me right now. Welcome back to another episode of the daily show for October 12, of course, by Discovery Day program. I am your host, JR. My phone just had a notification and I turned the uh, I turned the volume off so nobody will disturb us for today um, while we talk about the stuff that we usually talk about you know the observances the um, pieces things that happened today in history uh, the uh, place of the week and the stuff of the day right so it's gonna be you and me for today or I mean I think it has been since uh, a month, two months ago, two months ago. Oh. But anyways, today we'll talk about facing your fears. Uh, I would say it's an appropriate observance for October because what's the holiday that everyone is waiting for uh, for this month? That's right, Halloween. It's about fear. Well, technically it's not all about fear, but it has something to do with fear, right? So why not face your fear before Halloween? Um, cookbooks. We'll talk about cookbooks. We'll talk about gumbo, if you haven't heard of that. It's a dish, by the way. Um, for our history, we'll talk about Christopher Columbus reaching the New World, which was the Americas or the American continent. You know, they call it the New World before, a long, long time ago. And then we'll travel to Madagascar. Um, and since we're talking about Madagascar, I am going... Is it kind of weird on how I pronounce Madagascar? <laughs> Madagascar. There we go. Anyways, since we're talking about that place, I'm going uh, a little bit out of our mini theme today when it comes to our animal of the day. Don't worry, it's just the animal of the day. Um, because instead of going uh, for Disney animals, you know how there's a movie titled Madagascar by uh, DreamWorks or from DreamWorks. So we're gonna go, we're gonna showcase an animal that was introduced or that was part of that movie madagascar yeah and yes it's gonna be about what half an hour talk of this place well not just this place but we'll discuss this place so you might get annoyed on how i pronounce this but hey i'm sorry you know uh, that's just how i pronounce it <laughs> okay let's go ahead and start Today's observances, let's start with the one I mentioned about fear, International Face Your Fear Day. There you go. Now, if you're wondering, that picture doesn't look like, I mean, the, the, the person in the picture doesn't look like uh, it's being, or he's, I don't know if it's a he or she, but that person is being fearful or being scared at something right now. Well, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. Um, anyways, there are countless fears that hold people back and cause them to miss out on so many of the great things in life because they think their only option is to live with their fear. Uh, people are afraid to fly, right? I mean, for some people, um, or go to uh, or to go up tall buildings. Yeah, especially for people who are scared of heights. And there are also people who will be scared doing that uh, paragliding right there so i put it there because you know some people would would have that fear but uh, i'm not saying you have to do that but there are some other minor fears that you have i'm pretty sure that you may be able to face right um let's see what else what what are other fears that a lot of people have snakes that's that's one right uh, spiders or insects um, in general so those um, so for today it's about learning or encouraging yourself to face them you know to face those fears uh, international face your fear day is a uh, catalyst or it's considered to be a catalyst designed to give people the permission and the encouragement uh, that they, that they need to step up to their fears and say no more you know i'm not gonna be scared of this anymore you know um this is not a day to sit idly but it is for identifying of course facing and overcoming your fear 
So generally, it is about mustering courage, you know, getting your, your courage and taking control. Um, so for this observance, like I said, I wouldn't really advise you to literally face your fear, you know, especially like say, if you have fear in height and then you suddenly like go to a high place, of course, your safety is still the priority. Um, another way for you though, to celebrate this observance is to sit with, let's say your family, your friends, uh, or your housemates, you know, and discuss or have a discussion about your fear. So when you're going to be having a discussion, of course, you need to have a topic. Uh, and we already have a topic, right? Which is the fear. Uh, but what can you talk about the fear? Where? where, uh, where? Well, here are some of the questions that you can definitely have a discussion with. So first, you identify your fear. What's your greatest fear? And then have you experienced it? So obviously, that's going to be a yes, right? Because uh, you cannot say you're scared at something if you haven't experienced it yet. Um, and then uh, a good question to follow up with that is, was there a point in your life where you had no other options but to face your fear? If you've, if you've come to that uh, point in time or in your life uh, that you are presented with your fear and you have no other options but to kind of like overcome it at that point, right? And then lastly, if you did, if you were able to overcome it, uh, what did you feel? What did you feel, right? So, I mean, since we're having this discussion already, um, I will tell you a little bit of myself. I, I guess, <laughs> you know what? It's not I guess. I will admit. I will. I will just admit. I have a fear of cockroaches. There we go. Um, there are lots <laughs> of those in our country, especially when I was growing up. Um, they're not just big, but the thing though is, oh, something I noticed about cockroaches here at least, um, if, I, I don't know if they do fly, but so far the ones that I encountered are not flying, they're just like crawling, crawling really fast, but in our country, that's their thing, they fly, they like, they really fly, which is kind of annoying, you know? Uh, and for whatever, whatever reason, I find those creatures kind of like smarter than I expected. You know, it, it kind of feels like, uh, esp again, especially when I was growing up in our country, you know, what what they're going to do when they when they go inside the house is they'll be like, uh, they, they'll come as a group. You know, I would say like about a group of five. Yeah, you're, you're rarely going to see a cockroach that goes by itself. There's... At least when I was growing up, again, I'm, I'm sharing my experience. You know, when I see one, I'm gonna see, well, when I see them, I'm gonna see more than one. And they're kind of like in a position where they have roles to play. I'm, I'm telling you, if you if you find it weird, that's how I am, ex or that's how at least I remember it. You know, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but that's what uh, that's what I remember, especially growing up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's like one of them will, will have, or, or pretty much like all of them will have roles and let's say one will be the bait. So if you try to chase him, there's, uh, one that will kind of like bother you. So the rest can, can escape, you know, and then one of them will kind of uh, guide the rest of the roaches to a specific location, maybe a kitchen or so, but yeah, I guess I'm just overreacting, but Hey. You know, uh, just like what Ian is always saying, fear is illogical. And maybe the fear in me is the one controlling or the one, uh, what is, uh, uh, reflecting these assumptions in my mind. So, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, but there was one time when a group of, uh, a group of roaches by the door, uh, they were just like chilling in there, you know. Uh, I feel like I was in the, uh, what do you call it like a mexican standoff you know like we're i'm staring at them they're staring back at me and trying to see who's gonna move first um but i had to go out because i had to i had to go to um I, i'm sure it's not a school i think it's i can't remember where i was supposed to go it was a weekend so i had to go out i had to go out um so uh, what happened i ended up having an all-out war against them <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of call it an all-out war, you know. 
so what I did, I get the insecticide uh, and uh, basically kind of like putting my life on the line as I engage uh, those those annoying uh, bugs, those those roaches, you know. Well, the good news, you 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 see me here, so I won the war. I eventually won against them, and uh, let me tell you, that was that was one of the best moments in my life. Granted. I still hate them. I'm still not com comfortable seeing one, so I may not have over, uh, you know, overcome it or uh, fully got over it. But that day, I was able to win against my fear. So there you go. What about you guys? What, what what's your quote? <laughs> I'm not gonna say fun because like facing your fear is not really fun, especially at first. You know, it's. It's gonna make you uncomfortable, but what happens after, you know, the feeling that you get after when you realize, hey, I just overcome my, f I just overcame my fear, you know, I got over my fear. So let me know, let me know if you have any similar experience to me. It doesn't need to be the same fear, but your own fear. So there you go. What's the greatest fear, and were you able to overcome it in, in a uh, point in your life? There you go. Next up. Well, it's, you know, this one's not about fear, but this one is something that you shouldn't be fearful about. Cookbook. Cookbook launch day. So, uh, cookbook launch day is a day when people come together and launch, not have lunch, launch. It means to, you know, to start something. Or in this case, start compiling a cookbook. There are many types of cookbooks, such as those written by famous chefs, professional cookbooks, written for culinary students and working chefs, uh, single subject cookbooks, and those dedicated to international and ethnic food. Now that is, for me, the last part that I said, you know, like cookbooks about international and ethnic dishes. For me, that's one, that should be one of the most important uh, knowledge that we should be able to pass to the next generation, you know? It's, because it, it, culture, uh, or food has something to do with culture, not just music, not just the dress, not the, the fashion, but also food. So this is also, you know, passing, uh, what do you call this, ethnic recipes for dishes or um, food. That is kind of like preserving a part of uh, someone's culture. So that's why for me, I think that's one of the most important thing too. Um, Another type of cookbook is the uh, community cookbook, which is a type uh, that is most often started on cookbook launch day. This type of cookbook focuses on home cooking and family recipes, and documents regional and local history and traditions. There has been a long history of these types of cookbooks in the United States, which have uh, many times been compiled by, let's say, church groups, schools, uh, women's groups, and or you know other organizations members of these groups and organizations contribute a family recipe a publisher is often used to compile the cookbook then the money is raised from the cookbooks or the money that is raised from the cookbook sales for the organization or for another cause there you go when it comes to the history though the first cookbooks here in america um, were collections of family recipes handed down from one generation to the next. See, that's what I'm talking about. Passing your knowledge, you know, uh, from from your generation to the next generation, kind of preserve uh, what happened, in, not just in history, but in the culture too. In 1742, an American edition of Eliza Smith's The Complete Housewife uh, became the first cookbook printed in the colonies. American Cookery by Amelia Simmons was likely the first cookbook written by an American and the first cookbook to feature recipes that originated in America such as cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie. Um, that was part of it too. In the late 19th century, Fannie Merritt, um, farm, or Fannie Merritt Farmer, her um, Boston Cooking School cookbook became the first to include precise measurements and scientific terms and became, by the way, a bestseller. So there you go. I guess for this, you can celebrate this by simply just having an access to a cookbook and see maybe you can learn um, a new dish or maybe you have a cookbook that 
that uh, that was from your family, maybe your grandparents, or maybe somebody uh, gave you one as a gift. Um, now, I guess now is the time to go back to it as a celebration for this observance. And speaking of which, speaking of cookbooks, one awesome dish that you may have found in cookbooks is is the next observance, the gumbo. Yes, gumbo. Uh, first of all, apologies for the picture, it might be a little too blurry, but don't worry, we'll talk about it in case it's kind of hard for you to see what's inside, right? Uh, let's see, National Gumbo Day celebrates gumbo, which is a stew um, that originated in southern Louisiana in the 18th century. Just as the word gumbo, oftentimes today means a mix of cultures. See what I mean? Like recipes and stuff, it actually... Uh, for this dish, for example, this is like the result of, of, of different cultures in one dish, right? Pretty amazing. The dish itself is a blending of culinary traditions of different cultures, uh, West African, uh, from which the name gumbo may derive or may have derived, Choctaw, um, French, Spanish, German, and surprisingly, Filipino. I, that last part I wasn't expecting. Uh, there are many types of gumbo, and common ingredients are meats such as chicken uh, or andouille sausage. Or uh, uh, yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it, andouille sausage. And then it also has it also can have seafood such as crawfish, crab, and shrimp. Uh, the holy trinity of vegetables, of course, the onions, bell peppers, and celery, and uh, okra. There you go. Uh, it is often made with uh, fillet powder, which is made from ground sassafras leaves. Uh, the stew is usually served over rice, and the two main varieties are Creole and Cajun gumbo. Gumbo is the state dish of Louisiana, um, in case you guys are not familiar. Um, and originally was the only popular or was only popular in the Gulf Coast region but started gaining a wider popularity across the country in the 1980s. There you go. Uh, let's see. Well, it did mention shrimp, but I think the good news for me is that it it's uh, shrimp is not really required. You can actually use crawfish or crab. There you go. I mean, uh, so because a lot of you guys already know I'm allergic to shrimp, right? So if there's shrimp, I won't be able to enjoy it. But I can substitute shrimp to, let's say, crab. Uh, crawfish, there's really not a lot of meat in crawfish. So I would just prefer crab, even though it might be a little expensive. But that means I can uh, I can try this dish without worrying about my allergies. So there you go. What about you guys? Have you tried gumbo before? Or uh, I don't know, maybe some of you guys used to live in Louisiana and got a try of this amazing dish. And again, this is a dish that was a result of different cultures, you know? So that's pretty awesome. And then we do have other notable observances for today. We got Ada Lovelace Day. Now, this observance is dedicated to Ada Lovelace, but it's not because today is her birthday. Because first, if it's her birthday, I'm, you know, I, I would include her to uh what do you call this to to our notable figure but nah she, she it's not her birthday today um actually in fact it was someone else who created this observance under her name now this observance was created in 2009 by sue Sharman anderson um she has the goal of inspiring more women to work in STEM fields. Okay, there you go. Uh, which, you know, when you say STEM, uh, I'm talking about like all caps because it's uh, an abbreviation or not abbreviation. Is it an abbreviation? Well, no, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, let's see. By raising the profile of um, and celebrity women who currently work in these fields. Um, Ada Lovelace is considered to be the very first computer programmer. Her original name was Augusta Ada Byron. Um, her surname changed after she got married. Uh, and then she was born in December 10, 1815 
And then in 1835, which was 20 years after, um, Ada married a king or William King, who was the Earl of Lovelace, thus getting the uh, last name Lovelace. Um, and then they had chi uh, three children between 1836 and 1839. Uh, next, National Savings Day. Well, that's, that's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's a day to encourage people to save and not spend money on things that are not really necessary. Now, this this is a good reminder for me. I tend to uh, I tend to spend something that is not really necessary. Now, my problem is, I would I would try to justify uh, things so I could buy them, which is not actually a good practice. You know, it's always best to uh, it's always best practice. I mean to always stick to your budget if you already spent your budget for the whole week hey you might want to wait until next week right it's it takes a lot of discipline so for national savings day i think i thank that observance uh for reminding me that hey only buy the necessary stuff and then we got old farmers day another straightforward observance um for old farmers but of course for farmers in general right and then own business day now this is another straightforward uh observance you know if you own a business whether it be a monkey business or i don't know minding someone else's business um that, that, that today is your day if you have your own business and then pulled pork uh a delicious kind of meat that's for sure you know and then world arthritis day now another um not another but at least an awareness you know the last one is a day uh for awareness that uh about you know the costs and the uh, negative effects or how people are negatively affected by arthritis so those are our observances uh we got a total of a lot uh, well, i did say a lot so we get the first three and then we have six more so what we talked we just talked about nine observances today so feel free to uh choose what which one you wanted to celebrate or if you want to celebrate all of them hey you know be my guest pretty awesome today in history so 19 oh i did say 19 my my bad 1492 there we go after sailing across the atlantic ocean italian explorer christopher columbus sights a bahamian island believing he has reached east asia his expedition went ashore uh, the same day and claimed the land for Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, who sponsored his attempt to find a western ocean route or route to China, India, and the fabled gold and spice islands of Asia. So again, this day, uh, this is the, the day on that year, 1492, when Christopher Columbus reached or reaches the uh, quote-unquote new world that is the american continent contrary to popular legend educated europeans of columbus day did believe that the world was round as argued by by saint isidore in the 17th century however though columbus and most others the uh, they kind of underestimated the world's size you know which is which is gonna be you know which is gonna be a thing especially back in the day we don't have any rockets it's not like we could just fly and see uh, like the earth for ourselves, right? So uh, they kind of had like a miscalculation. So they calculated that East Asia must lie approximately where North America sits on the globe, right? They didn't yet know that, uh, that the Pacific Ocean existed that time too. Uh, during his lifetime, Columbus led a total of four expeditions to the New World, exploring various Caribbean or Caribbean islands, the Gulf of Mexico and the South and Central American mainlands, um, but he never accomplished his original goal, a Western Ocean route to the great cities of Asia. Uh, he had discovered for Europe the New World, whose Riches over the uh, next century would help make Spain the wealthiest and the most powerful nation on Earth. There you go. And again, I mean, it, we're not talking about current uh, current event, right? It's not a current event. It's 1492, so we're talking about 
um, Spain being the wealthiest, the most powerful nation on earth, that was somewhere around 1500s to 1700s, or it could be more. But yeah, that's where it started for Spain. And then we have 1964, uh, the Soviet Union launches uh, Voxcod 1, I hope I pronounced that right, into orbit around the Earth with cosmonauts Vladimir Komarov, uh, Konstantin Fyokstistov, and Boris Yegorov aboard. Voxcod 1 was the first spacecraft to carry a multi-person crew, and the two-day mission was also the first flight performed without space suits. That, that, that sounded unsafe at all, right? Um, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, the U.S. space program consistently trailed the Soviet uh, program in space firsts, a pattern that drastically shifted with the triumph of the U.S. lunar program in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Then we got some notable figures born today. First, we got 1935 Luciano Pavarotti. You should have heard about him, if especially if you like... Uh, uh, what do you call this? Opera, right? So he's an opera uh, tenor um, who also crossed over into popular music um, because he did perform with you know with pop artists and other contemporary artists, eventually becoming one of the most commercially successful tenors of all time. There you go. Um, next one. Not, I mean, I guess singer also, <laughs> yeah, but you may have known him more as an actor. Um, he's, he's from Australia, you know. Hugh Jackman, 1968, best known for his long-running role as... I don't have any claws, but what I meant was Wolverine. Um, but, he, I mean, he, he also made more movies than the uh, X-Men franchise. Um, but I think he got his breakthrough. I believe he got, he got his uh, breakthrough... Um, from that, from those movie sequels, you know the X Men. Um, he also did my 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 uh, top one movie for from him was uh, the Greatest Showman, and I believe some of our students saw it and loved that movie too. And yeah, he was singing in that movie, so he was acting and singing. Uh, what else? I think Late Mr. Rob. Yeah, uh, it's also a musical. Um, he. He was there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what about you guys? Who? What's your favorite movie of um, Hugh Jackman? As far as making singles, I don't think he was he's making singles because he's more of a, a theater actor. So th that's where he's singing, but he's not really like uh, a pop um, pop singer. You know, he's not like that. And then we have Nancy Kerrigan, 1969. So, Nancy Kerrigan was an, um, an outstanding American figure skater who, unfortunately, is best known for being the victim of one of the most infamous assaults in sporting history. Uh, here's what happened. Prior to the 1994 uh, Little Hammer, or Little Hammer Winter Olympics, an assailant later confirmed to have been hired by the ex-husband of her rival, Tonya, or Tonya Harding, used a police... A uh, baton. Wow, they used a police baton to um, strike Kerrigan on her landing knee during the U.S. Championship in Detroit. Kerrigan was injured, but of course, uh, or thankfully, recovered quickly. Both Kerrigan and Harding skated at the Olympics. Kerrigan winning the individual silver medal. Then later, Harding was banned from the sport for life. I mean, come on, that's messed up. Kerrigan also won an Olympic bronze medal in 1992, as well as World Championship bronze in 1991, and then silver 1992. There you have it. Those are our things in history. Moving on to place of the week, Madagascar. I'm sorry if you're getting annoyed on how I pronounce it. It's just, it's just, you know, English is not my first language. I try my best, but. Maybe some of you guys will say, wait, what's wrong with uh, how you say it? Well, it kind of sounds off for me, you know. Anyways, today is, I mean, this episode is for national symbols. We got national animal, lemur. Lemurs are primates found only 
on the African island of Madagascar and uh, some tiny neighboring islands. Because of its geographic isolation, Madagascar is home to not just them, but many other amazing animals found nowhere else on Earth. Lemurs may have floated there eons ago on rafts of vegetation and then evolved in isolation over um, countless centuries. So yeah. Uh, lemurs use their hands and feet to move nimbly through the trees, but uh, can't grip with uh, their tails as uh, some of the primates' cousins do, you know, compared to, let's say, a monkey. Uh, Ring-tailed lemurs um, also spend a lot of time on ground or on the ground, which is unusual among lemur species. Um, they forage for fruit, which makes up the greater part of their diet, but also eat leaves, flowers, tree bark, and sap. There you go. And then I have an interesting uh, plant which is called the uh, national plant. Um, I mean, that's not what it's called, but it's the national plant of uh, Madagascar. It's baobab. So baobab, it has another name actually. But for now, let's talk about this unusual looking tree, I would say, you know. It's a real emblem of Malagasy flora. The baobab is a majestic and sacred tree that counts eight species. Um, six of them only grow in Madagascar. The Baobab Alley contains the most specimens in the world. Uh, because of its trunk filled with water, it, the Baobab tree is also called the bottle tree. And it kind of looks like a... I would say bottle, right? But not just a regular bottle. I would say the... Um, I forgot that brand where they have that bottle, but it's all straight up right there. But anyways... It, um, it's also called, or this kind of tree is also called a uh, bottle tree. And then we have the uh, Fanorona. They're uh, one of their traditional games in Madagascar, you know. Um, it's actually the national game. It was derived from a game, Alkirki, which might be over 3,000 years or 3,000 years old. Um, Fanorona has three standard versions. There's a Fanorontelo. Uh, Fanaron Dimyand and Fanaron Chivi. The difference between these variants is the size of board played on, uh, or yeah, played on. So uh, let's say the first one, Fanaron Tello, it's uh, it's played in a three by three board game, and then the uh, Dimyand is five by five, and then um, I think the one you're seeing here right now will be the uh, Chivi, which is a five by nine board. Um. Yeah, so there you go. Those are our stuff for Madagascar. Moving on, stuff of the day. So, not Disney animal, okay? We're gonna be talking about Madagascar's animals. So, we got... What's her name again? I forgot. <laughs> well, the animal we'll talk about will be a hippopotamus or a hippo. Um, I think he, her... I'm trying to remember. Uh, what's her name? What's her name? Okay, I remember now. Gloria, there you go. Her name is Gloria from the movie Madagascar, obviously. Um, and who was, by the way, voiced by none other than Jada Smith. So Gloria, her character, is a female hippo who resided in the Central Park Zoo as an at attraction, all while being good friends with our main characters, Alex, Marty, and Melman. Um, anyway, some facts about the hippos. That's glorious picture and this is a picture of a real real hippo hippos are large uh, semi-aquatic mammals with large barrel shaped bodies short legs and short tails and an enormous head uh, they have grayish to muddy brown skin which fades to a pale pink color underneath they are considered the second largest animal or second largest land animal i have to put land in there because i mean come on whale is an animal right on earth and of course, the uh, largest, not the tallest, when you say large, like, it's about the size and the weight too, right? So the largest would be the elephant. Uh, to, stay, to stay cool in the blistering African heat, these hippos uh, spend most of their day in rivers and lakes. And then their eyes, nose, and ears are located on the top of their head, which means that they can see and breathe and uh, while they're submerged in water. You know what's more these super cool creatures sweat an oily red liquid which helps protect their skin from drying out and acts as a sunblock 
So they have a, they have a natural sunblock. Um, and then hippos are most active at night uh, when they forage for food. They they are though they're even though they're active at night, uh, they're herbivores or herbivores. So they eat mostly grass. Uh, and speaking of eating, they do eat a lot of grass. In just one night, they can they can eat up to 35 kilograms. That's about what uh, 90 pounds, or I could be wrong, but it's somewhere there, 90 pounds of uh, grass, right? That's that's too much, even if it's just grass. <laughs> All right, plant of the day we have Hukara. I think I pronounced that right. Hukara. There you go. Even though it says E. I think it's pronounced as Kara, Kara, like Kara, Kara, like carrot. There you go, Hukara. There you go. Um, with its colorful foliage, Hukara is the perfect perennial to brighten up any garden throughout the entire growing season. Hukara form forms attractive basal mounds with heart-shaped, rounded, or triangular leaves, which can be smooth, wavy, or ruffled. The leaf coloration varies by cultivar, but mainly includes various hues of amber or bronze green or green, gold, pink, purple, deep purple, and silver vein. There you go. And then musical artist of the day. We still have uh, one of my favorite artists, especially I just learned that he's still making music, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, I I've been listening to his music, but... I got stuck to, uh, I got stuck to his '80s music, and then I, and then I just recently listened to his most recent songs, somewhere around 2010 and up, and I'm like, wow, he's he still got it, you know, <laughs> he still got it. He's not just an internet meme. <laughs> but anyways, we'll talk about "Beautiful Life" 2018. I highly recommend you guys to listen to this song. It's actually a good song. It's very uplifting. Um, anyways. Uh, this is a song from his 8th studio album with the same name, which is Beautiful Life. Um, it, this song debuted at number 6 on the UK album's chart and became, uh, it became Rick Astley's 5th top 10 album in the United Kingdom. In Germany, uh, the album debuted at number 40 on the German album's chart. And then the album has also charted in Austria, Belgium, and Switzerland. All right, we're almost there, guys. Next word of the day, a 10-letter word for October. But it's not October. Uh, I mean, the word is not October. Our word is discipline. Yes, it's D-I-S-C-I-P-L-I-N-E. Discipline. Um, it could be used, this word could be used as a noun or a verb, but the essence or the meaning of the word would be the practice of training people to obey rules or a uh, code of behavior uh, and then using punishment to correct disobedience. So uh, so it could either be like focusing on a practice uh, or focusing on the practice or training people to uh, in a certain certain specialty. Or also, you know, using punishment to correct disobedience, like for kids, discipline. And for our tech trivia, I don't know what happened. I guess I accidentally moved the, I'm sorry, the uh, the header right there. It says tech trivia. It's supposed to be tech trivia. Do you guys know in Germany, traffic lights, there are traffic lights that are installed on the ground. And it's because those traffic lights on the ground on the ground is or are for people using their phones at all time you know kind of makes sense you use your phone like this right you use your phone you look down you don't see the traffic light uh so they have traffic lights on the ground but i'm just i, I just want to say i think we as humans are just really spoiled you know i mean if you're gonna cross the street i just want to say you know you can it, it's a better idea, I guess, or it's it, it's a better way, not a way. I well, I guess idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, when you're crossing the street, I think it's better that you pay attention around, um, you know, to your surroundings, or not just even crossing the street. 
um, even if you're as long as you're outside and walking you know or commuting uh, you gotta be alert you gotta be you gotta know what's going on around you and if you're focused on your phone all the time hey I mean you know uh, something might be happening already and you're not aware so just saying but yeah there you go guys that's our show for today thank you for joining me um i hope you learn something new i hope you like uh our episode today um don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below you know facing your fears that's a good observance uh, we got a lot of good observances today guys so uh and i hope you like the madagascar version of our animal of the day um but with that said i'm gonna have to say goodbye for now i'll see you uh on the next episode bye